Uh, morning, everyone. Welcome to City Gym for anyone who travels beyond Limerick. Uh, <laughs> and our, our own guys welcome as well. All right, so um, today we're going to go through bench press. Hopefully, give you a few tips, a few pointers, and help you all uh, improve in some shape or form. Um, some maybe a little bit more than others, but um, we'll do our best either way. Okay, so get on the slide there. Uh, oh, the wrong one. It's <laughs> <laughs> the wrong slide. It's the wrong presentation. Um, okay, so just before we get started, you might have seen this uh, this workshop advertised and thought, well, one of those guys is a, is a world champion, but I'm not sure about the other one. And you'd be correct. And so a slight disclaimer in that I'm not a world champion, so I can't teach you from personal experience how to become a world champion. And um, so, you know, results may vary. Um, <laughs> So we'll just go through what we're going to cover today, so we'll just give a quick overview of bench press and then we're just going to run through individual differences, maximising bar path and efficiency, how to create good arch, leg drive and then some existence uh, selection. So, what does the bench press look like? Okay, so first question I'll ask is, you know, what does a bench press look like? Is it something like this? Is it more like this, which is probably more old school? Jen Thompson here. Ellis McLean, and uh, this individual here, who uh, that just looks really uncomfortable, um, or someone like Marissa Inda. So the point is, is that there's not one way to bench press, and depending on your structure, what suits you, your strengths and weaknesses, your setup is going to look completely different to the person beside you. Does that make sense? You know, um, so it would be remiss of me to kind of say that there's one way for you all to bench press. But if we can kind of find what works best for you, find the setup that suits you best, um, then you should be well on your way. All right. Um, so we're going to look at general recommendations that we can apply across the board, and then some things that are more specific to the individual. All right. So click down there. So. And one disclaimer, if you could find a presentation that would teach you how to bench perfectly, we'd all have it at home and we wouldn't be here. <laughs> yeah. We'd all be training. Um, so this is just to kind of uh, reiterate that point that, you know, we have sort of, this is where our general recommendations are going to be for. Oh yes, then we have our outliers. Um, and then people who don't respond well to training. Uh, so, yeah, so the vast majority of what we're going to be saying is going to be applied to this category here, which is sort of the, the average response. So if we have, for example, the response to a training program, here's your average response here, there's your low responders, and there's your high responders. Um, does that make sense? Okay. So if we look at, firstly, similarities, and then differences um, between lifters. So these are, like, between two people in this room, you're going to have differences in grip width, foot position, um, whether they take... Um, lift out or the self lift out, uh, the equipment they wear, and I don't mean bench shirts and that kind of thing, but wrist straps, heel shoe versus a flat sole shoe. Some people wear a belt on the bench. Uh, the point of contact that will, so where you touch on your chest basically, that will differ between people. Uh, cadence, I know for example, someone like a Jen Thompson recommends a fast descent. Um, I tend to recommend a more controlled descent. But it's just, again, it's what works best for the individual, okay? And the cues that you'll give someone, um, and then the arch position. And then we look at the things that will be pretty similar across the board. Shoulder position, um, trying to reduce range of motion, whether that's through getting bigger, or creating a, a higher arch. Back tightness, so get tight is a cue you can give virtually everyone. You know what I mean? Uh, looseness on a bench, that's the enemy of power. Does that make sense? Squeezing the bar, so actually physically squeezing the bar in your hands, and then rep consistency. So every time we set up for a bench, every repetition we perform, we're trying to ingrain the pattern, right? So we're trying to make them consistent from rep to rep, okay? Um, so, who have we here today, right? And this is why I, I distributed that survey there during the week, just to kind of get a better idea for who's in front of me now today. 
Uh, so we kind of have a fairly even split um, insofar as we have, so in terms of training experience, here's people who would be very well experienced, so training more than five years, training three to five years, one to three years, and then less than a year. Okay, so most people are fairly decent level of experience, but we have a few, um, I suppose, novices as well, but that's fine, you know. So just if any of the information that we're explaining here today is a little bit too heavy for you, is kind of beyond where you're at, just call us on it and maybe get us to explain it again, um, just so that it makes sense for you, okay? Because there's no point in you just kind of sitting there and being like, geez, this is great information, but I honestly haven't a clue what he's saying. <laughs> That's not helpful for you, okay? And then we're not doing our job, okay? Right, so we'll move on to technique then. So what, um, what things can we do to manipulate technique to help us bench press more weight, all right? Um, so for the most part, you all know how to bench press fairly well, and probably very well, to be honest, you know? Um, but we're just looking at maybe what small tweaks can we make just to just to get a little bit more out of it, like a fraction of a percent or a percent or two of an improvement, all right? So some things we can look at is we can try to maximize the efficiency of your bar path, reduce range of motion, increase leg drive, and increase overall tightness, okay? So the first one then is maximizing bar efficiency. So there's three what we term joint actions involved in the bench press. The first one, obvious enough, elbow extension, right, so where you straighten out your elbow. Horizontal adduction, so bringing the arm in towards the midline of the body, does that make sense? So as you're pressing up, bring your arm in like that. And then the last one then is shoulder flexion, which is basically moving your arm in this way. So uh, arm from down here to up here, does that make sense? Um, so, uh, Changing your bar path won't really have too much of an effect on these two, but it will have a very profound effect on this one, okay? And Barry's put this in, so I'd like him to elaborate. <laughs> so basically, this, the whole, like, changing your bar path, within reason, your most amount of stressor is gonna come from your shoulder flex and bring it up. So basically, if you come too far forward on the way down, coming up, you're essentially gonna have to do a massively strong isometric hold on your bicep, or even contract if you're strong enough to pull it back in. And that's where most people fail. So it's not actually your shoulder flexions where you're failing on most benches with that kind of a form. It's actually one of the lesser two groups it has failed because of a, a missed group of bar path. So just adding in as a little bit of caveat. Okay. All right, uh, so out of the group, who understands this concept? So this is kind of the, the data we got back from that. So for the most part, people are in the, the group of, I understand what you mean by trying to uh, improve the efficiency of your bar path. I'm just not very good at implementing it. Some people have no idea what I'm talking about. I may have and, uh, and then others under, understand it and implement it all the time and will ignore you guys. All right. Um, okay, so here's some fantastic artwork uh, by yours truly. Um, and this is just to help to try to demonstrate this concept, okay? And the, the positions are a little bit exaggerated just to sort of help kind of uh, make it a little bit easier to see what's going on, okay? So right here we have someone bench pressing and they're at the bottom position, right? So the bar is on the chest here, okay? And this distance here represents the distance from the bar to the shoulder joint. Does that make sense? Okay, so if we have the, the same uh, start point between two lifters, next one on. So the first um, lifter, initiates by pushing back towards the shoulder, shortening this distance here, and then finishes directly over the shoulders. Contrast that then with second person, same start position, but then as they press up, they're going straight, right? Notice how this distance is greater if you go back a couple of slides compared to this one. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So we go on again, and then we finish here, right? So, if we remember the distance here, we move on a slide, and we relate it back to some basic physics, our moment arm is going to be the force times that distance to the shoulder joint, right? So if the, the distance is greater, 
it's a, it's a greater moment arm to overcome. So we actually have to, for the same weight on the bar, we have to produce more force to lock out the weight. Does that make sense? So that's how just by improving the efficiency of your bar path, if you're producing the same amount of force, you'll be able to have more weight on the bar. All right? So you don't fail a lift because you were, well, unless it's ridiculously heavy, um, because you were weak through the entire range of motion. You fail a lift because you were weak in a specific range of motion. And it's by improving that that you, uh, that you move on to lift more weight. Does that make sense? Okay. So just for reference, this is for um, a moment of torque around your shoulder joint, so it's for shoulder flexion up. So in this kind of analogy, when you're blocked up forward, you've residual torque, basically trying, the bar is trying to come down to your belly button while you're waiting for a rack command, so you're sitting there still shaking and struggling. So it's just a <coughs> massive waste of effort. Yeah. So, I just threw this, so this is for wrist position. So basically a lot of people, you'll see more commonly than that, would bench on the far left, which is a, an extended wrist position. So, especially when you're considering arching, in this position, you're marginally reducing your range of motion because the bar is closer to you anyway, but you're also creating a lot of torque around your wrist. So you'll see a lot of people who bench with an extended wrist, the moment they go to press will do this, because all they're trying to do is the moment they press, their elbow is trying to get under their wrist to push the bar up. So I'm forcefully in the middle. So basically that when you come down, your, we'll say the circle of your hand is directly over your elbow. So when you press, your elbow isn't trying to shift back or forward or either way to get under the bar. So your wrist position kind of a lot because it's your only point of contact with the bar is your hand. So when you engage with force, if you're in the latter position, a lot of people will slip back or they'll have to flare to get under it. Um, and the moment you start flaring, it's very hard to stop that. So you essentially end up back here and stuck in this kind of position. So that was just a point to note of wrist positioning, but we'll cover that later in the practice. Okay. Um, okay, so moving on to the next aspect of technique, and that's on reducing range of motion. This quote is a little bit tongue in cheek, but I, I kind of like it because basically there, there's a bit of truth to it. Um, so every good powerlifter must make a decision to become great. Use steroids or shorten the range of motion until the lift is unrecognizable. I choose the latter. Now, you could use steroids and try to shorten your range of motion, then you'd be, then you'd be onto a winner. Um, but everyone here is kind of IPF. Anyone IPFP? Okay. Um, you don't have this option. Basically. All right. So we got to work on this one, right? So if we move on to the next slide there. Thank you. So there's three ways basically that you can reduce your range of motion. You can widen your grip if you haven't already done so. So who here uh, has a max index grip? So they, they hold the bar with their index finger on the ring of the bar. So show hands. Okay. Um, who has their hands inside the rings? Okay, two. Yep. Yeah. And anywhere in between that? Okay, it's the remainder. Okay. So that would be probably the quickest way to shorten your range of motion would be to move your grip out. <coughs> that doesn't suit everyone. So I'm not advocating everyone does it. And um, particularly if you've any kind of issues with the uh, shoulders and that. Sometimes a, a wider grip can tend to aggravate that. But it's an easy way to reduce your range of motion. Next one is increase the size of your arch. And we'll get onto that a little bit um, shortly after this. And the last one then, also an easy one to do, is actually get physically bigger. Um, mm -hmm. So you can, you can just gain a load of weight, a load of body fat, and you'll shorten your range of motion. Or you can do it a little bit smart, more smartly and try to actually add some muscle mass to your chest, your upper back, triceps, shoulders, all that. And that will actually have a, a, doubly, a doubling effect. Um, it'll shorten your range of motion, but also by having more muscle there, you can produce more force. Does that make sense? All right. So, do you want to take this bit? Yeah, so um, basically it's kind of when and where should you arch. So essentially most of your practice arching should be for a competition style bench. Um, you see an awful habit where, we'll say for accessory pressing, people doing incline pressing will end up in a hoop. Like, they'll arch out of habit rather than actually useful. So, um, 
you're actually is for expressing maximum strength. So when you're trying to press a very heavy competition style bench, there's also a caveat where you should be trying to do a lot of non-arching bench to get yourself stronger to an entire range of motion. Um, so you're not limited to just when you have a fully elevated chest position, that's where you're strong. And then if your chest falls any bit, then you're, margin, you're absolutely miserable below that. Um, so basically we're gonna cover later on when and how to, or where and how to arch. Um, you'll see a lot of people when they arch, it'll be entirely pivoted around the lower back and the chest is just rigid and flat. So a good arch should be kind of a global arch that brings in the rib cage being expanded and arched and everything. So we'll cover that later because it's much easier to show physically than actually talking about. Um, that swings into the lower one, which is, does anyone here, does your lower back cramp when you try and arch? Yeah, so a lot of that is squeezing your lower back to try and create your arch, which is an arch coming from here, rather than actually lifting your ribs up with it as well. So it's, it's all that being pivoted around one or two vertebrae down your lower back. So then that maximal contraction, which is why you'll end up with your back cramping. And especially if you're just after squatting, it's more than likely gonna happen as well. Um, so as I'm saying, should you accessory, or should you arch for your accessory lifting, like your pressing or incline pressing? I would be in the favor of not doing it because your accessory lifts are to get stronger, not to get, you know, your, tech, your, your competition benches are technical, then your accessory lifts are just getting overall stronger, so you should try and avoid arching too much there. You should have a, a strong enough core where you can keep it in a flat position yourself. Okay, uh, so moving on to arching techniques. So there's two kind of styles, uh, at least that I'm aware of anyway. Um, there's more than this, but these are kind of two good start points, if you like. If you don't know how to arch, this might be a good start point for you. So the first style is where you start by planting your traps and your shoulders into the bench. Okay, this will make more sense once we get onto the demo, but uh, I'll try and describe it as best I can. Um, and then place your hands on the inside of the rack and use that to kind of wedge yourself into position. Set your hips and then work your feet back in to try and elevate your, your rib cage more. All right. So that's the first style. Second style then is to go from. So the first style would be start top down. This one is more bottom up. Set the hips, um, and then from there you almost hinge around your hips, create the arch, and then do the same thing again just to kind of wedge yourself into position. Does that make sense? Does anyone in here use either of those styles? First one. First one. Okay. We, we use a slightly different um, position to set up, but the fundamentals are pretty much the same. Uh, so it's always important uh, <laughs> for your bench to make sure that your equipment is in good working order. So I recommend you smell the bench before you start. Well, that's also one thing to take away. Sometimes people can have like over theatrical arches that add very little to their actual arch. So if anyone's ever watched Owen setting up, and I can't talk down him because he's probably one of the best benchers in the world. If you watch him after that position, he unarches again and then sets up his proper arch. So that first part is yeah. essentially to get himself hyped up really. It, it, does, it aids in very little towards his actual arch, which is grand when you're benching by yourself and you've time, but if you're on a platform and you're coming out with 30 seconds left and you have to go right, have to come up and down and back, back out again, back in again. So. <laughs> A good arch is, good, is the goal, but being able to get there concisely and consistently is also you know, one of the key points to take. Another thing as well, just on the point of the, the overly theatrical arches, have you ever seen someone who sets up what looks initially like it's going to be a fantastic arch, and as soon as they set their feet, they completely flatten out? Yeah, we don't want to be doing that, okay? Um, right, so the next part then is leg drive, okay? It's kind of a risk reward. Um, the bigger arch you have, basically, the more downward facing hips are going to be. So it's yeah. kind of quite hard to direct force using a leg drive to shift you back, yeah. um, rather than just lifting your hips up off the bench. Okay. So it, it's not that it's. Um, you can do it less, it's just much harder to do it. Um, so people tend to do it less. You'll see a lot of people with massive arches tend to just prefer to be super stable and press around that rather than actually try and leg drive through it. But yeah, no, you're, you're a, lot, a lot of people with big arches tend to leg drive less, but just, it's probably more lack of risk of not wanting to lift their ass off the bench, like I do. 
Okay, so coming back to our survey data. Um, so understanding of leg drive, basically, do you understand how to use leg drive? And again, like with the, um, the question earlier on, most people understand what's going on, just can't implement it. Um, so to be honest, the demo will probably be of more use to you than, than this part, all right? Um, and then there's some people that understand how to, how to do it, use it all the time, again, we'll be ignoring you. And uh, there was, this was one person with a more specific response. Uh, so I know about it and I try to use it, but I'd like a more technical explanation. So I like that answer. Uh, okay, move on. So how to improve leg drive? First thing being foot position. Um, cueing, timing, and core bracing. So, the first thing with, the, with regards to the foot position is to try to get your ankle behind your knee, right? So if you're if you're if you're bench pressing and your feet are out in front of your knees, you're not going to be able to get any leg drive just because of the position you're in. Does that make sense? So you want to bring them back in a little bit so that you can actually drive properly. You can get some um, force out of your quads, all right? Um, the next one then is cueing. Does anyone here have a problem with their bum lifting off the bench? Okay, so usually a cue that I use for that is to think not like you're pushing into the floor, but think like you're trying to push the floor away from you. So the force is almost entirely horizontal. Um, now, sometimes that can cause the other problem where you're, you're inclined to slide a little bit as well, but for the purpose of um, stopping your butt lifting, it can be quite helpful. And you can kind of get around the, the sliding thing as well just by applying chalk onto your t-shirt and stuff. Um, timing then as well. So who here has trouble with timing of leg drive? Okay. Do, do you mind elaborating? Or? Uh, specifically when you actually got the it's easy enough to get a position to maintain that. Mm. Yeah. Um, an analogy I heard once, which I kind of like, is to think of like a push press. So does everyone know what a push press is? So if you have your, your strict press and you have your push press where you dip and you drive. So with the push press, um, the, the drive itself starts from the lower body and then moves up along into the upper body, right? If you think about that with the bench, as soon as you get your press command, um, the instantaneous reaction should be to drive from the legs and then from the upper body. So it, it almost, the force almost radiates from the lower body into the upper body. Does that make sense? Yeah? The difference being in the bench, your legs are already flexed, so with a strict press you have to flex down to flex your legs and push up. Whereas the bench flex down, that's you know, you're not allowed to move downward out of a stack movement, so you're already flexed down, bring the bar down, push up out of it. Yeah, apologies if I didn't make that clear. Um, and the last one then as well, now I'd be interested to hear Barry's th thoughts on this, but um, so I generally recommend when it comes to bracing, in contrast with your squat and your deadlift, when you take your air in and you're trying to almost belly breathe, so you're trying to fill your stomach, fill the belt if you like. With the bench, I actually recommend the opposite. I recommend you breathe into your thoracic cavity. So as you're inhaling, your chest should be rising. You don't want to see that on squat and deadlift, but on the bench, that's what I recommend. So for mine, I do start with belly breathing, so I breathe in and then chest breathe. So basically you're filling, you're trying to breathe down into your lower, um, diaphragm and then swell up as well as you fill up so you're trying to really basically create a balloon of a chest as you're in there um, and then core bracing so like for a lot of mine especially when you're initiating it like a, a hard leg drive the softest thing in your body is generally your belly most of the time and if you have a hard leg drive and no core bracing your belly just goes like a little accordion so basically none of that power gets transmitted up into your shoulder so you see a lot of people will have soft bellies, they leg drive, and they just crunch halfway through, like they just, a lot of it gets absorbed, and then about a third of it or half it gets into their shoulders. So basically, 
what I cue on mine is just I press like there's a, a flex of the lower core basically so that as you for, transmit force up through your feet hits your hips which hit a solid core which hits your shoulder so basically you transmit all the way up through but we'll, we'll show more in the practical later just kind of just having 80% core tightness spiked up to 100% during the start of leg drive and then back down to about 80% again during the press but we'll, we'll talk about it later on. Okay, so this is just kind of demonstrating what I was saying uh, a few minutes ago. So it's to try to get the ankle behind the knee. All right, so does that make sense? Yeah, okay, so it's just to demonstrate it. Okay, um, and then, so some of this is kind of repetition, but um, when we're talking about improving overall tightness, here are some things you can look at. It's your arch setup, belly and chest breathing, um, locking the shoulder blades into position, foot position, the unrack. How many here are cell phone rackers? Good. Okay, so this is probably more important for you. Um, tension in the hands. So, how many here have ever heard the cue to squeeze the bar? How many haven't? Probably more important. Okay. If you take nothing else away from today, take that one cue away with you is to squeeze the bar like you're actually trying to crush it, okay? Um, and then another cue I like as well is chest to bar. It might only be very subtle, but if you just raise your chest ever so slightly, that will have a double, double effect of tightening your back up, and it'll also shorten your range of motion, just ever so slightly as well, all right? And even just the thinking behind that, you'd see a lot of people that have a good chest up position, come down, 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 just about get near and they then come down to press like that. So even if you can't lift your chest up, keep it where it is. Think of lifting it, but just keep it in place so that when you come down, you're bringing the bar onto your chest rather than just coming down, shying away, and then trying to press out of that position. Okay, so just before we move on to resistance exercises, is there any of that that's kind of gone over people's head or that doesn't make sense? Or do you have any questions about it? So over the shoulders. Yeah. Over the shoulders. So start over the shoulders and finish over the shoulders. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. You good? Okay. Great. So the next bit then is just very briefly want to touch on assistance and supplemental exercises. And this is um, a kind of conceptual model from de novo nutrition. Anyone ever heard of that? Oh, okay. Um, never mind. <laughs> but basically, I quite like it because it gives it gives a good outline of specificity and transfer to the main exercise, right? So, for the most part, your efforts should be spent here, right? The competition lift. That's where the vast majority of your training and your focus should be on. After that, we move to assistance exercises that are highly specific, but they're just ever so slightly different from the competition uh, lift. So we have, for example, a longer pause bench press, um, touch and go bench press, or a tempo bench press. Or they'd be in that zone there, right? Um, board press, things like that, all right? The next one then are just slightly different again. So they'll still have some carryover, but probably not as much as zone two. So that's things like incline bench, close grip bench, um, wide grip bench, um, those kind of exercises. And then we move to much more general exercises, right? Um, so things like dumbbell bench press, dips, um, machine bench press, uh, where else is there? Uh, what's this one? Uh, flies. Okay. So on the surface, you might think, well, surely they have no carryover whatsoever. <coughs> but what else can you get out of these exercises? <laughs> Tension. Definitely. <here. laughs> yeah. Um, so I think someone said it. Muscle mass. Muscle mass. Hypertrophy. And that we want that, right? So probably more so than the squat and the deadlift. The amount of muscle mass you carry makes 
a massive difference to the bench press. Right? So the more muscle you have in the upper body, particularly, um, the more capacity you have to lift more weight. Does that make sense? It's not the only factor involved, but it's a very important one. Okay? So does, does that model make sense? So how, how we go from most specific to most general, and this will have the most amount of carryover, and this will have the least amount, but it can still be of value as well, right? So then this is taken from a presentation that Mike Tashir of Reactive Training Systems gave last year, um, and it's a way to individualize, if you like, your uh, the, the assistance exercises that you choose. So this graph, you probably think, what the hell is this? But this is basically just a velocity versus position graph, right? So the start here is off the chest, and as we move along, all the way up to the lockout, right? So if we can try to visualize this at the start, so as we come off the chest, we have a spike in the velocity, then it slows down, okay? And then we have a, um, a point where the velocity is um, so the lift is stalled, right? And then it picks up again, and then it decelerates then again as we get to lockout, okay? This is the area we want to focus on. Not here, not where the velocity has uh, a stall. At this point here, or this, this, um, this range here where it's slowing down, okay? That's where you're losing force, right? So, based on that position there, that's roughly just a little bit off the chest. That's where it starts to slow down. Does that make sense? So you might think, oh, well, I get stuck here, so that's where I'm weak. It's before you got to there. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, what the, the second curve is then is then when we, hypothetically, if we train this weak range of motion, that's what happens to our curve. So you notice we don't fix this problem. It just becomes less pronounced. Okay, so the weight that you fail on will be heavier. Do you know? So we haven't fixed it. You're never going to fix it. But it's less pronounced. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, no, that's dead, right? So for the vast majority of the time, people tend to be weaker in the bottom half of the bench press. And think about how much more you could bench to a four inch board than you could off your chest. So I recommend you, gener you generally focus your attention here when it comes to assistance exercises, right? So we're talking about exercises like long pause bench, um, it's, uh, like a one or two inch board press, um, pin presses, uh, like Barry was saying earlier on about training with a less pronounced arch, so you're increasing the range of motion. Those types of exercises. Uh, okay, we'll move on. Thank you. Right, so troubleshooting your assistance exercises. So again, taken from Mike Tushier. So if we're weak in this position here, so about five centimeters off the chest, what does that mean? Your body's unable to maintain force output through the pause and into the start. So the, the muscles that are weak, front deltoids, pecs, um, and also consider whether the stretch reflex is sufficiently developed. So does that make sense? So uh, the storage of elastic energy and being able to use that, right? Um, if we take, for example, a thistle, this is quite, I quite like this term, so squish. It's a very scientific term. <laughs> so what is squish? So there's not enough tightness and leg drive to maintain a solid pre pressing platform. Does that describe what we're here? Squish. We suffer some squish. So that's more to my point of a poor belly brace. So literally you're just squishing your belly when you're going to press, you're just, so you're just yeah. squishing in the middle. Basically the weight's compressing, right? Uh, the weakness, that's more so technique, but also uh, consider the, the strength of your lats and your upper back. Um, and then I'll just go through one more. So inability to arc the bar path. So that means you're struggling with the uh, pushing back, right? 
weak muscle group there is going to be your front delts because that's what produces that movement. Remember I was saying shoulder flexion? That's pushing back towards the shoulders. Um, okay, does that make sense? So I'll send you those slides later on so you'll, uh, you'll be able to go through that in no time. Oh yeah, <laughs> I don't like questions. But, but, please, but please ask. Um, no, seriously though, any, any questions on any aspects of the presentation? Or so probably get a bit more of the practical I know because Art of English Society is, I, I don't really book, or articulate well the idea is it's much better to see it and actually see what people do because it's much better learning by seeing and moving rather than just explaining stuff. You yeah. can all get that online. You'll probably take more from the demonstration anyway, but just <coughs> having heard it in the presentation, uh, you'll be briefed on it a little bit as well. So you'll have, you'll have an idea and then it'll make more sense as we go through the practical. But uh, no, seriously, any, any questions? On any of that? All good? A little concerned with any questions. <laughs> um, be honest with me, did that make sense? Did any of it go over your head? Okay, good. Right, we'll take maybe a five minute break and then we'll go through um, demo then. Right? And then after that we'll head to lunch. Alright? I'm just going to run through. Uh, basically a couple of bits of my setup and Eric might point out different bits along um, and then you might get a couple of you just to demo your own setup so we'll just have a look at bits and pieces um, but we'll see more of that later on after lunch when we go training anyway but um, so basically uh, as Eric was saying there's two ways of setting up where you either plant your arse first or plant your shoulders first um, I am planting my shoulders first but I would use the, the I'd hold onto the bar I'd never advocate really holding the frame because you're setting up, planting your shoulders, everything, like holding your frame, and then you're just completely removing your shoulders out of the arch again by grabbing the bar, so I don't see the point in doing that. Um, so basically, I'd go back, I'd sit up roughly where it should be. Um, my position is max uh, index, so I'm actually indexed on the ring. Um, pull out, plant my shoulders down. So when you're doing this, I'd squeeze my lats down and like that. So down behind you. So basically you're trying to create a big upper back and you're fully in the brace as well. So I create that position um, and then try and arch and come back. Then slowly, slowly, slowly squeeze hips down. So basically you see a lot of people sometimes would arch, they'd come back up like this and then they'd drop down. And basically when you just drop it out, you just basically flatten out and shift your shoulders. So as you come back, just squeeze hips down, down, down. Um, and then basically for lift off, you try and get a pin clearance that's basically very similar to where your hand position is as you're off. So you want to try and do as little lifting as you can to get out of the rack. So it's kind of very similar. So you see a lot of people that have too low of a position, so they have to come up over the rack like that. Or they be too high and they have to actually forcefully unarch to get it out and arch back down again. Both of these basically a good waste of effort. Um, and any bit of a tightness in the setup you've got, you've then removed by getting your shoulder back out. It's also Tarkus point to saying why a lot of people, if you're doing self-lift offs, it's kind of more important to set up because then you don't have someone who's spotting and loading all day rushing who just yanks you back out of the arch, um, which is kind of detrimental at times. So basically, so then when you're set up, you basically squeeze everything, pull down, down, down. So as you're coming down, as Eric was saying, chest up, so as you come down you go, you're trying to lift your chest up towards the bear, which almost gives you a slightly bigger arch if you can get it to move, or else you're just maintaining chest position. You see a lot of people, as I was saying, coming down, they get to here, they flatten in, and have to press up out of it again. So basically all you're doing there is you're getting a good arch, bleeding a lot of energy, coming back, and then you have to also reflex your spine as you're coming up, which you're not going to do under maximum loads. It's quite difficult to do. Um, with <laughs> <laughs> um, 
just points I think of when I'm setting up. Uh, I tend to try and press knuckles to the ceiling, so these knuckles straight up with emphasis on baby finger. So as you're coming down, come down and you bring, you're pointing your knuckles up at the ceiling. You can see some people come down and they flex their wrists back like this. So those are people that are saying as they press they go like that. So as they press their, their shoulders flare back, they're sticking like that. Whereas I try and point knuckles to the ceiling and then just through here you're trying to forcefully punch your baby finger knuckle up into the ceiling. Um, so basically you're trying to get all your movement up that way with a slight outward movement so it's up like that. Um, that's most of my setup, Art, if you want to go through yours and we'll just show points that differ because yours is slightly different than mine. Sure, yeah. Um, just before I do that, um, one of the things I think that's very pronounced with Barry's setup is like even there with just the bar or 70 kilos, you can see how much tension is in his hands. Does anyone else pick up on that? Yeah. It's just how forcefully he's squeezing the bar. Um, you do some of your training without a lift out, don't you? Nearly all. Just because I train alone most of the time. Do you set up? Um, further down along the bench if you're doing that, or do you the same? I try and stay the same. Um, that's one point as well, Joe, we were saying the difference between setting up arse first and shoulders first. If you're setting up shoulders first, you generally are fairly sure where you're going to be with regards to the bar. So if you set your shoulders under the bar, you bring your hips up to you. But sometimes if you set your arse first, then lift your shoulders in, you can be miles behind the bar or miles ahead. I just find it's much easier for me just staying consistent by setting shoulders first, because you know where you are, and then you're setting your hips below you. Or where do you actually, when you're like lying down, on where are you thinking, like, are you like eye level, or like where exactly you should be placed on the bench? Um, for me personally, I set up with essentially just around forehead height. So I try and be looking just, let's say there almost for me. Yeah. Then again, a lot of mine are self lift out, so I can just, so I don't have to go too far, but again, if I do shift back, then I'm not just going to punch the other side of the safeties. So just a small bit of clearance, enough just to make sure that even if you do flare a little, that's going to be hitting the other side of the safeties and catching yourself out. Yeah. Uh, just on that, uh, what's your take on, on racking the bar with your hips in the air? Uh, and then setting your feet and your hips after once you have the bar in the position where you're going to start? I'm not averse to it. Um, one of the lads I train with, he, like, he does that way because he finds it's easier for him mm. to get in and actually, because the weight through his shoulders then, he can pin his shoulders a bit better and plant his hips a bit more. Um, I, I can just kind of keep planting the hip, hips down anyway, so it's kind of not much of much as for me, but essentially, like as you were saying, not everyone's form is the same, but the, the emphasis you're trying to put on stuff should be similar. So no matter what you're doing, you're trying to keep your shoulders pinned and get a good arch. If by that means you have to take the bar in your hands as you plant your hips, yes. so it's what you need to do. Yeah, I guess if it's inclined to put you out of position, don't do it. If, if, if it aids to, your position. If it so aids, yeah, works, you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. anything you can do that aids your position and, isn't like, and you're not likely to fuck it up, um, well worth doing. If it's something that's kind of like, it works most of the time, it's probably not yeah. ideal because then the one time on the platform you're not going to do it. Um, which is never fun. Um, so I'll just go through my setup and then just you can kind of uh, get an idea for both of them. So basically, mine isn't too dissimilar to Barry's, but um, like my knees aren't the best, so I set up with a kind of a white base. And you remember I was saying earlier on about uh, getting the ankle behind the knee? When I do that, it's not as pronounced because that position is just really uncomfortable for me. So I'm gonna be something like this. So set myself up here, okay? So I'll take my, my grip, so I'm just slightly uh, narrower. So I'm middle finger on the ring. First thing I do then is plant the feet. Go through, okay, set the shoulders, and then as I pull myself back into position, I'm trying to set my shoulders more and bring my chest up. So just do that again because I can't get out of position. Okay, and if I was taking a lift out, 
Um, to answer Emma's question, I normally go eyes underneath the bar, but as I'm self lift out, I go a little bit further, just just to make it a little bit easier to unrack. And then, so this is just a, a thing I've always done, um, is as I'm taking my air in, I'm pulling my shoulder blades together, so that's why you see me doing this. And then as soon as I come back down onto the bench, I press out, I to unrack the bar. Bring her down, and back up. Is that alright? Yeah. So that's my setup for Sparries. Which you prefer? <laughs> so I'll just show, um, I'm going to pull my t-shirt up against my back when I do it. But I'll show arching position for, um, as I was saying earlier about arching in your lower back versus trying to arch with your chest involved. Um, and then I'll do one or two cues that I like to do with my feet. So, you see some people arch with lower back. As I was saying, this is kind of the one that'll make your lower back cramp. Try and do it now. So if you pull my t-shirt up against my back there. You can see most of that is coming from my lower back. With very little chest involvement. But if I go... You can kind of get a bit more thoracic flexion out of it. Um, so basically you're making more of a global arch. So then you're arching like this as opposed to this. So as you press, you're not going to just try and hinge on one point. You're actually just going to... It's a bit more stable. Um, and basically, if you're arching a lot around your lower back, you're either you're going to be cramping, it's going to be awkward to do, and also your chest isn't possibly as high as it can get. So then when you help like arch your thoracic spine, you're actually, by doing that, you're lifting your chest up as well. So you're just making the range of motion shorter by doing that. Um, Arthur was saying, well, foot position, about not pushing down or pushing forward. Uh, the cue I use is, if you were sitting on a beach and you were trying to push your feet and toes into the sand, so like 45 degrees down that way. So you're trying to push down and in. So that's essentially my leg drive cue. So as it comes down, it's toes down and in, like that. So as you can see, like the bar is trying to move upward. So like I'm lifting my chest up and I'm not moving my arms. So if you couple that with the arms moving, you're essentially get, getting this much motion for no arm movement. So if you couple that with arm movement, you're basically moving that load off your chest with a lot less force than you would if you were strictly pressing it. Can you just replicate that a second? Just, just a little bit where you're moving your legs. Yeah, so see how he's doing that? To see how that is like the analogy of the push press I was saying earlier on? So legs into the upper body. Yeah, so so then I was saying for core, core bracing, if you're doing this um, and you have a soft belly, as you push your hips, your shoulders stay planted and your hips just kind of move in seclusion and you're just kind of fucking rocking around. But as I press, I come down, and then just as I press, you get a little bit of a, a, an extension in core tightness, um, just to make sure that just as you press, you're, you're basically maintaining a rigid torso so that everything you generate from your feet gets drilled up into the bar. Um, so basically all you're using your leg, or your leg to for is to kind of break the inertia of the bar sitting in your chest, so you're gonna get a, an initial peak in velocity just as you press. Um, so I like to kind of spike core tightness during that to try and help get as much as I can into the bar. That's my setup really. Any questions on that? Or if there's any bits you want to break down, it's a, because it's kind of hard to think of what people don't do or don't know, so basically I'll run through it all and whatever you want to ask, just, just grab as you do. Will you go over what you were saying a while ago about, uh, say, obviously when, when you're doing leg drive, you're not going from zero to 100 when sparking yeah, the yeah. you're not going bang fully. Um, with a bigger arch setup, uh, you're saying risk versus reward, uh, could you just like this out there? Yeah, so um, basically like that, when you're pinning yourself, your shoulders into the bar, you'll have driven your shoulders in, you're using your legs to help you know, cantilever up your hips. So being in this position anyway, you're maintaining a lot of core, or a lot of quad tightness. So basically when I'm arched, like in this position, I'm probably using about 70% quad tension, Coming down, build that up a small bit up to about 80, and then you kind of spike quad tension and then hold it. Um, so like on the way down, you're maintaining probably about three quarters of what you can do with your legs. You're holding them because you want to hold your chest and everything up. Then just you're pressing, 
it's a quick kind of a, a sharp drive of the quads yeah. and then the hole where you've gone to see some people will drive like big Owen is a kind of culprit of this he'll drive and then leave his hips back down yeah. so basically he pushes everything back and then his core falls away from himself so basically everything he's driven back has to st should stay where it is so rather than coming down driving and then leave your legs soft you can only drive and hold where you are um, just basically because you you've shifted your platform back to help yeah. shift the bar up so you keep that where it is then until you're finished the lift and when you hit that uh, when you hit that initial uh, sorry, yeah. when, you hit, when you're coming up from the bottom and you yeah. do that initial push is uh, keeping your butt on the bench specifically what you're cueing what way you're trying to push uh, I, I cue basically what I'm trying to do is if what we will do with some of the lads is put your hand behind their head okay. and as they're pressing you're trying to get them to shift into your hand so you're trying to shift back you're trying to slide forward. yourself along the bench yeah, yeah. Um, so I wouldn't focus on keeping my butt down rather I'd focus on shifting back okay. um, because if you're focusing on just pushing your legs you will try and lift your hips but if you're focusing on pushing back it's going to shift back so I wouldn't actively think of keeping my hips down I'd actively think of shoving myself back um, and by doing that you don't leave your hips come up yeah. What do you suggest on like individual differences, like in terms of like limb and like just looking there, I'm like I wouldn't have that mobility to yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, wider foot placement or you know. Um, <coughs> wider foot placement help, or even stepping them forward slightly. Um, Let's we'll say like Louise Miller doesn't have the ankle mobility for it, so she benches like this, yeah. which I'm not a fan of, and I give her abuse for it because <laughs> I find we drive with that. What we're doing all the time when you're squatting is you're trying to keep your knees from getting into a valgus position, whereas that's actively leg driving into a valgus position. So I'm trying to get her to turn her feet slightly more forward. Um, but like that, you can always improve in your active mobility, but it's, it's what kind of where you are now is what you need to work with. Um, so we'll look at that later when you start benching. But essentially, as close and as forward as you can get comfortably, um, I wouldn't try and force yourself in any position that doesn't feel natural as natural as an arch would feel. Um, because you're probably just going to end up wearing something down or hurting or annoying something. Um, but setting up where you are now and then working over time to get it into a different position, for sure, but yeah. yeah. We'll have a look at that when you bench yourself. Yeah. Cool. Uh, anything else you want us to go through? Yeah, maybe something in the presentation that wasn't clear that might make more sense if we went through it here. When you're pushing off the chest, mm -hmm. is it straight? Do you go back first or like up and back? Well, you're obviously going to be going up, but you're oh. for the first quarter or so, yeah. you're pushing back as well. Okay. So maybe I'll show you what that looks like. So, there's the platform, not me. I'm just really excited. Uh, <laughs> right, so set that up there now. down and then the first quarter as I say pushing back over the shoulders that does vary slightly from lifter to lifter because I have a tendency um, when I'm failing or getting tired that I'll like flare up a little bit um, so most of my drive is to get up, for, for my first third is trying to get vertically up because um, I would have a failing point of getting back a small bit, um, that's just what happens smaller and that's an arthur, um, that they're not, sometimes when I'm fatigued they're not strong enough to keep the elbow down so I try and keep them tight and then push back, um, but it's very subtle because my, my actual bar range of motion back to forth is narrower than arthur's. His tends to come back a bit more, mine tends to come up a bit more. Um, I think that's probably because you touch a bit higher in your chest as well. So there's actually, the, that horizontal distance is shorter to begin with. Do you know what I mean? So um, it kind of depends on where your, your point of contact is. So the higher up that is, the, the more subtle that will look. Yeah. Do you get me? So mine's a bit more subtle than that. But yeah, it is yeah. kind of a push backward. Yeah, it's trying to extend everything all at once. Am I correct in saying that both of you, the bar from never actually break the plane of your eyes? Not on mine, no, yeah. No. 
because by right, if you like where your shoulders are, your shoulders are going to be lowered in your eyes. So if you have back here over your eyes, you're having to basically statically lap hold the bar in place because it wants to fall that way. Um, so you'd be close, but uh, I, I never, I, I can still see beyond the bar when I'm locked out because it's probably hovering chin level. Okay. One of my chin levels. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably huge for me because when I'm, when I'm coming through, I find that sort of final three, four inches is not only quite difficult to lock it out, mm -hmm. but very unstable. So by the time I get to sort of here, all tension is gone, and it's just a case of well, trying to fucking lock it out. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was going to be a sign of lats kind of giving up that if you're mm -hmm. up here and you're a bit unstable, it's because these are sort of relaxing. So basically, as you pressed up, you've kind of sacrificed a lot of tightness to kind of get it up. Yeah. And then you end up with lats that have kind of let go a small bit, so then your, your stability is kind of gone. Um, you, which could be why you're gone a bit over eye level as well then. Are you inclined to let your shoulder blades yeah, separate as you come up? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's, that's what you need to work on, so it's trying to get those tighter and maintaining that position. Like if you're thinking, rather than pushing the bar away from you, you're trying to think, lock out the elbows and almost drive yourself into the bench. Do you get me? Yep. So you're trying to, to, to try to maintain that shoulder position. Um, okay. Any other specific um, things that anyone wants to go through, or any any one thing that you fall down on that you want to maybe use to address or something like that? Can you talk about the activation of that, like setting the scapula? I'm quite like struggling with that personally. Okay. Uh, I said even just. Sort of Warmer point of view, but that's not the first time someone's told me that, so. Right. It's just really normal back at this stage. So sometimes you can kind of improve that by. Um, do you ever do straight arm pull downs for lats? So basically, you can kind of feel like even using cable machine, um, it's much of a similar position. Um, it's standing up right So if you look at my shoulder as I pull down, they should kind of pull to my side and kind of sit in, so you're almost flattening your back. Um, so as you lose them, you then lose all stability because you're kind of, you've rounded your base. Like when I'm training here, like whatever I set myself, it's like my shoulder is bunched and I actually really have to like hop myself to get comfortable, like whatever I'm doing. Mm. So I'm pulling in rather than down or something. Yeah, and do, when you mean? set up, do you think of pinching your shoulder blades? Or what way do you try and... So I'm trying to bend the bar, because yeah. I struggle with tightness in my back, it's on my squats as well, so I pull the shoulders, whatever I pull them, they bunch, and I can't sit on the bench properly, yeah, yeah. I have the problem, the weight's over my head now, and I'm trying to, like, to yeah. you know, which is not good. Yeah, <laughs> you're trying to get a dance here. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you see it, it's like, oh, that was it. Okay. It's, it was not good, like. Would you mind showing us now? <laughs> <laughs> So that's a firm yes. <laughs> um, okay, you can show it later on, just because okay. I think others might benefit from it. That's the only reason. Um, Steve, what cues are you using uh, to to set your shoulder blades? Uh, or what are you What are you thinking as you're setting up? I'm trying to get as high as possible. So I th I kind of have problems with my knees as well. The IT bands are in tight, so I'm holding the right knee the whole time. It's very uncomfortable when it's very flexed. So I kind of have to balance, as you both are saying, the distance between the knee and the ankle. So I'm trying to get right back up to the top of my shoulders. Uh, first thing I'm doing on the leg is actually I've moved my right hand a little bit out further than my left because it's the stability in the right side that's all well over the shop from using the mouse, by the way. Yeah. Um, so well, use a vertical mouse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm squeezing with the two outside fingers and consciously twisting or well, attempting to twist obviously the steel bar and the torque, um, and then pull, like trying to make that movement down, but it's... Well, it's under so short. <laughs> it's that, it's that just, just here at this point, and I move up, and I'd say from here to lock out, I'm just thinking, what the fuck am I at? <laughs> just get this thing back. Right. Um, it's, not, it's not really... Uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned any cues though. Yeah, but so, my, my cues are before mm. I set up, or as I'm setting up, rather than during motion, because yeah. I just don't think. Yeah. yeah, now don't get me wrong, you don't want to be thinking about the movement as you're doing it, but immediately prior to it, you might have one or two cues or trigger words just to remind you what you're supposed to be doing, you know, through one aspect that you struggle with, like that, for example. Um, 
Yeah, the the grip thing that's that's unusual. I haven't heard of that before. The, I've heard of that. Yeah. One no, one the, the staggered grip. Yeah, that one hand being slightly out in the other. Um, we'll have a look there in a while. You better if you want to do it now. It's up to you. I'll do it now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't prepare any speech. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I gave a speech, it was stolen off me. It's not right. So I'm probably about here, on my axle there, twisting, and then just go for it. Like it could be from there, or it could end up over here, it could end up out there. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, are you trying to actively tuck your elbows so as you're coming down this way? Um, no, my elbows are kind of shaped funny. Yeah, because you're, you're quite tucked. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know, I was just trying to retain tension the whole way through it. I think that's one way I retain tension. Mm. Other things are like putting me in the on the room. People that makes sense. See, that's, <laughs> that's one reason why I actually don't like that cue of trying to bend the bar. Because look what happens. Your elbows turn in, and as a result, you are inclined to over tuck. So I just prefer just to cue to squeeze the bar. Because that tends to improve everything else. Um, so that might be one thing to try. Um, the other thing as well is like even just seeing there now, I know it's only the empty bar, so it mightn't be exactly reflective of if there was more weight on the bar, but um, it appears like your your traps are up very high. So I'd be cueing you to try to not only pull your shoulder blades together, but also try to pull them down. Because I tend to pull my shoulder blades down and apart, um, as if you were to top for pull-up position. That's kind of where I like to be for a set of a bench. So basically I try and pull my shoulder blades down and down and wide as if you're doing almost like a lat spread, because then you're planting a big wide back hopefully, um, on the bench. Um, so it's, it's down. So basically, like if you're making a point up here, it's quite hard, quite restricted around the shoulders, but if you flatten down, um, like you're saying it ends up quite over your face, which would yeah. be so symptomatic of being up very high like that. Um, so if the steady, like the steady deadlift, do you, know, do you pull your shoulders down as you say? Uh, yeah, I pull myself into the bar. Yeah, yeah, so much of a similar kind of a, a brace for your shoulders that way is almost what you're trying to do at the side of the bench. You're trying to get yourself you know, away um, rather than hunching up. Okay. So um, if you try it there, um, but when you do it, the same kind of feeling you get on deadlifts when you pull your lats down, you know, to kind of set your back like that. Yeah. Try and get that same kind of t lat tension. Okay. Yep. Oh Christ. See, now you're getting tight. Yeah? Yep. Yeah. Try to be aggressive with the press as well. So see when you're on the chest there, bring it down and keep it there. See the way your hands are much further back than your elbows. So you, you actually bring the bar down to your chest slightly more. Like there. So when you... So when you... Punch my hand, so I don't punch. Yeah. So you see, when I'm doing punches, like you're doing that position, no one ever punches like that. You never punch slowly, so as in like that. And that's my cue is that punch. You're always... By the way, you're trying to accelerate as fast and as hard as you can. Okay. You're just trying to move everything with intent. Um, but that looked a bit straighter. Um, but we'll see you later on when you walk. Because it's a very hefty landing on an empty bar. I'd probably cue as well, like as you're coming off the chest, not excessively, but just slight flare of the elbows because they're out. because they're inclined to be inside your hands. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. you have pecs. Use them. <laughs>